The Mali Empire was officially established in 1235 by Sundiata Keita. Now, although the empire would essentially build upon the great riches established by the Ghana Empire, it would technically succeed the Kingdom of Soso, which had begun to gain control over the region as the Ghana Empire started to become weaker. So how exactly did the Mali Empire become so legendary? Now let's get into it. Now as I said in the previous video, the ruler of the Kingdom of Soso was feared for his ruthless and tyrannical rule. Now this ultimately sparked a people's uprising which was led by Sundiata Keita, a warrior prince of the Keita dynasty, coming to a head in the Battle of Karina, where the Sosos would be defeated once and for all. Keita himself would actually never go to battle again during his reign, but his army were able to expand the empire to the south the west and the east, pretty much eclipsing the territory of the former Ghana Empire. At the empire's peak, it would cover a distance of roughly 1,000 miles across. And with control over both the Senegal River, the Niger River, and the Trans-Saharan trade routes that proved so lucrative for the Ghana Empire, the wealth of the Mali Empire was set to boom. Sundiata Keita was succeeded after his death in 1255 by his son Mansa Uli I. Although very little is known about Mansa Uli's reign, he is regarded by some sources as being one of the greatest rulers of the Mali Empire. Now in my last video I mentioned the importance of the cities Timbuktu and Gao, and according to one 20th century historian, Mansa Uli may have been the king who oversaw the taking of these cities into the empire. Although I do want to make it clear that the vast majority of sources credit much later rulers with the capture of these cities. One theory is that Mansa Uli may have been the first to bring them into the empire, but was unable to keep hold of them, meaning that later rulers would then have to invade them again. I don't know, this one is up for debate. And very little is known about the next few rulers. Uli was briefly succeeded by his brother Wati, who was then replaced by another brother, Khalifa. According to Arab historian Ibn Khaldun, and these are his words, not mine, Khalifa was insane and devoted to archery and used to shoot arrows at his people and kill them wantonly. So they rose against him and killed him. Now he would be replaced by Abu Bakr, the grandson of Sundiata Keita, of course the founder of the empire. Again during this time it doesn't seem that there was much of note that's gone down in history. The empire steadily grew and was relatively stable for a period of time. However it was a period of political instability after the death of Abu Bakr which led to the reign of the next Mansa. Mansa Sakura. Now it's thought that Sakura was once a slave of the Mali Empire, but now as king he was able to push the empire in new directions, literally. He is credited with a large expansion of the Mali Empire's territory, including that of the city of Gao, which as I mentioned earlier is something which there is much dispute over. Either way, Sakura seemed to be a very intelligent king, expanding the territory and strengthening relations with the rest of the Muslim world. He took trade to a whole new level as the Mali Empire would begin to flourish like it had never done before. Now just before we move on to the next phase of the Mali Empire, I want to point out that the impact of Sakura's reign isn't something which is set in stone. There isn't much reference to him in oral traditions, similar to a few of the Mansas that came before it, but later historians do credit him as having saved the Mali Empire from political crisis following the death of Abu Bakr. Now it's thought that following the death of Sakura, which supposedly occurred on the return from a Hajj in the early 1300s, there were a couple of short-lived Mansas before power returned to the Keita dynasty with Abu Bakr Keita II. Now his reign itself was a short one, lasting from around 1310 to 1312. Now the dates vary from source to source, but it didn't end in the way you might think. You see, he had a naturally adventurous spirit and looking out off the coast of West West Africa, he wanted to know what, if anything, lay beyond the horizon. So he gathered a crew together and set sail off into the Atlantic and never returned. This was after one failed mission in which he had stayed at home and sent the crew out on his behalf before deciding that he was better off doing it himself. Now it's not known for sure how far he traveled with his men, but there is some evidence to suggest that he may have made it all the way over to America nearly 200 years before Christopher Columbus. And I've actually got a more detailed video all about his expedition, which you should definitely go and check out at some point. Anyway, he intended to leave his nephew, Musa Keita, in temporary charge of the empire. But as he would never return, Mansa Musa wouldn't have to return the power back to his uncle. Now, just to quickly note, Mansa Musa is regarded as the richest man the world has ever seen. 
and he has a fascinating story, particularly of his pilgrimage to Mecca, which is the perfect illustration of his wealth. Again, I've already got another video on that story in way more detail, and you have to go and check that out as well. Now, it's thought that he became the leader somewhere between 1307 and 1312. As I said, the exact dates do vary, but the important thing is that his reign followed Abu Bakr II. And during his reign, Mansa Musa greatly developed the empire's standing as a center for learning, annexing Timbuktu and establishing it as the forefront of education, with heavy investment into mosques and universities, attracting some of the brightest and most inquisitive minds of the time. The greatest of these centers for learning probably being the Sankore Madrasa. Now I have to point out that the Sankore Madrasa or the University of Sankore was made up of three mosques, Sankore, Jingare Bear and the Sidi Yaya. The Sankore Mosque actually predates Mansa Musa and the Mali Empire itself, having been established in 988 AD. The Jingare Bear Mosque was built during his rule in 1327 with the move to establish Timbuktu as a particularly important center for learning. And the Sidi Yaya Mosque wouldn't be built until 1440. Now, just to give you an idea of what is meant by the term center for learning, it's said that anywhere up to 700,000 manuscripts would have been held at the Sankore Madrasa, making it the largest library in Africa at the time. And although Mansa Musa was a devout Muslim, this was never something that he imposed on the citizens of the Mali Empire. Freedom of religion was an important part of his rule, and perhaps one of the reasons why he commanded so much respect. After the passing of Mansa Musa, he was succeeded by his son, Mansa Magan. But with the empire at its peak, he could only hold on to power for four years before his uncle Suleiman would take over in 1341. Suleiman's 19 year reign from roughly 1341 to 1360 would essentially be a continuation of Musa's reign, ensuring stability and security for his subjects and continued wealth and prosperity, which by this point had made Mali a world renowned and awe inspiring empire. The trade of gold and salt was crucial in allowing the empire to reach the heights it did, as was the case for the Ghana empire, which came before it, with copper also regarded as somewhat of a valuable commodity. Mansa Suleiman's death in 1360 sparked a civil war and the Mali Empire would be in significant decline. Now this is roughly when rebellions from the Songhai people would begin, and the empire would also slowly begin losing territory to the invading Tuareg armies, a Berber people coming down from the north who had successfully seized Timbuktu. By the mid 1400s, Mali had lost a lot of crucial ground to the Songhai Empire, which had been officially established by Soni Ali in 1463. And you can see from this map of the region from the 1500s exactly how problematic Songhai was becoming, with Jene, Timbuktu and Gao now all officially under their control. Battles would be ongoing between the two empires until the death of Mahmud Keita IV in around 1610, pretty much marking the end of the Mali Empire. The Songhai Empire would continue to expand and grow out of the great foundations laid by both the Ghana and the Mali Empires before it. And to learn more about exactly what would be in store for the Songhai Empire, just click here and I'll see you there.